Okay. All right, welcome everyone. Uh, my talk is going to be on monitoring pulp with Prometheus and Grafana. So disclaimer, um, my only experience with this is spending about a week researching and experimenting with it spread out across like a month or two. I am not an expert. I'll probably get something wrong here and there. Um, problem statement. Uh, my infrastructure is a black box. I have a certain number of applications running on a certain set of hardware resources, handling a load that changes constantly. Things happen. Disks fill up. Uh, servers and services go down, traffic goes up, memory goes down. It's a very dynamic environment, and I can't really see what's happening, especially across, you know, even one server, but especially dozens of servers. Uh, so question, uh, how can I monitor for, um, predict, and prevent problems? When they happen, how do I find where they are, and how do I address them? Um, answer, collect data about your applications and your infrastructure. But the question that follows from that is, what now? Um, so data collection is not the goal. It's a precondition for our actual goal, which is understanding what's happening on the infrastructure, which is running my you know website or services or you know, streaming website or stock exchange or bank or telecom network or whatever. Uh, so what is Grafana? Uh, Grafana is an open source tool for monitoring, analyzing and visualizing uh, metrics in real time. It's used by thousands of organizations, including Wikipedia, PayPal, Verizon, uh, a lot, lots of big, um, big and small uh, services and names that you know. Um, so what do I mean by monitoring and visualizing metrics? Uh, this is what I mean. So um, if you, I'm not sure if you can actually read the uh, text, but um, memory and CPU, the number of logins to the service, the number of logouts to the service, you know, Google hits, sign out, sign ups, support calls, server requests. So a wide variety of different metrics here with a wide variety of different ways of visualizing them. Uh, here's another example. Um, so this is labeled as some kind of, you know, Jitsi meet installation. Um, it's showing, you know, the number of conferences going on at once, the number of participants going on at, uh, in, in those conferences at a time, you know, metrics like, again, you know, CPU and, and RAM, um, incoming and outcoming, incoming and outgoing, you know, data, um, completed conferences, you know, how many per week. Basically, it's many kinds of graphs for displaying you know, numbers, metrics, um, particular bits of data about something you want to track in a easy to understand way. Uh, so that's what Grafana does. Grafana takes data and makes it comprehensible in real time. Um, here are some examples of some of the um, graphing features that Grafana provides, um, time series, uh, state timelines, um, bar graphs, histograms, heat maps, pie charts, um, stats, so numbers, gauges, tables. Uh, you can show log streams. Um, you can show node graphs. Um, there's lists of alerts. You can even show like RSS feeds. And so all this data has to come from somewhere. The data can come from many places. Um, so there's time series databases. There's a couple of those. Prometheus is one of them. Uh, SQL databases, PostgreSQL, MySQL. Um, it can come from AWS. It can come from Azure. It can come from Google Cloud. It can come from Elasticsearch. And there's like a dozen other of these. 
so what is Prometheus? Um, Prometheus is one, uh, one backend for Grafana. That's a very popular one. Um, it has, I guess, two key features, um, which is PromQL, which is their query language. Um, and it's also pull-based, whereas a lot of the other ones are push-based. Um, so here's an example query. Um, populate a variable with the busiest five request instances based on you know, an average query per second over the time range shown in the dashboard. Um, that's just an example of like some of the complex kinds of queries you can build from the data you're collecting. Um, uh, what does pull base mean? Um, so uh, if you think about how you would collect data, there's, there's two different ways you could do it. Um, there's push based where you can configure all the different um, programs you want to collect data from uh, to tell them, here's where Prometheus is, go send your data there. Um, or you can have Prometheus tell, uh, you, can, you can tell Prometheus where all your sources of data are and have Prometheus request that data. Um, so that's, that's what Prometheus does, is it pulls the data from external, fr from sources, Sorry, I'm not explaining this well. So whereas with push-based, um, if you want to change some detail about how the data is being collected, like how much data or how um, how quickly it's being collected, like what what interval is being collected on, or um, or even like where your data collector box is, like if if you want to change it to a different node or if you want to set up a, a backup node or something, you have to roll out that configuration change to every single um, data source uh, can installation. So you, you'd have to like change your entire uh, container image if that's what you're monitoring or your, or your um, uh, server image. But with Prometheus, uh, there's this, um, basically all your data sources have a standard uh, data format. They expose an HTTP endpoint. Um, and then you kind of use, you set up service discovery so that they're automatically discovered. And it, it queries the HTTP endpoint to fetch the data. Uh, so why did I pick Prometheus versus one of the dozen or so different backends. Um, it seems to be one of the most popular. Uh, it seems to work especially well with Kubernetes. It's part of the CNCF foundation, which I guess means something. Um, it comes with a node exporter, uh, which is uh, basically for collecting system statistics like uh, CPU, RAM, um, memory, uh, disk, network I.O., that sort of thing, uh, which is one less separate tool to configure. Um, and exposing an HTTP endpoint on a web app is pretty easy, um, probably more so than configuring push. Um, so exporters. So Prometheus has the concept of an exporter. Um, like I said, it means you basically have a program running on the uh, either either your application provides a endpoint that provides these metrics or you have like a separate application that uh, collects them and then provides it at an endpoint and that's it's called an exporter um, so there's a postgresql exporter that connects to post PostgreSQL and then provides those metrics at an endpoint. There's a Redis exporter um, that does the same. It sends details about things like uh, request latencies, you know, Redis memory usage, the number of en entries in Redis, the number of commands per second, the number of items that are expiring, um, you know, and the PostgreSQL 
export or collect similar details like you know the number of transactions, the number of open connections, that sort of thing. Um, there's like a hundred of these um, for all sorts of different purposes. Um, one thing you can also do with Prometheus and Grafana um, is alerting. Uh, so basically, you know, flash red lights on the dashboard when uh, disk or memory or CPU utilization hits a certain threshold. Um, average latency or errors per second increases above a threshold. Service is unreachable for X number of minutes. Uh, these are all really important things if you're running a service. And it's nice to have um, a way to get notifications if this is going, if, if it's not working properly. Uh, so what benefits could this bring to Pulp? Um, so for developers, uh, it's much easier to monitor performance and memory consumption. The feedback loops are much faster. Um, it's a whole lot easier than you know trying to run HTOP in the background and switching to watch what's going on. Um, for users, it depends on which metrics we expose. I have some ideas, and I'd like to discuss them and maybe uh, ask if others have more ideas. Um, so possible metrics we could expose, um, the size of the artifact storage, the number of content, the number of repos, number of repository versions, number of distributions, the number of downloaded content versus undownloaded content, the number of API requests per second per endpoint, you know, the number of content app requests per second. Maybe, maybe we could find a way to uh, measure which repositories are most active uh, in terms of like what clients are downloading from. Uh, you know, running, waiting, and failed tasks. Oh, I. And that slide's supposed to be gone. Yes. Live demo. Um, so, uh, if can everyone see this? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, so this is uh, something I've spent a little bit of time working on. Um, there's a hidden pane here. So, uh, it measures the number of online workers, the number of content apps available the number of artifacts, both on disk and remote, the size of the downloaded artifacts, and the amount of disk space saved by um, not downloading artifacts, by having remote artifacts instead of on disk ones. Um, also, the number of running tasks, waiting tasks, tasks completed in the last five minutes, tasks canceled in the last five minutes, and tasks failed in the last five minutes. And so I'm going to start a workload and we can watch it go. So this is set to refresh every uh, five seconds, but it occasionally feels like it's taking longer. Um, Daniel, and what did you set as a workload? Do you have any details on that? Yes. Uh, so in the background, um, I'm starting uh, 10 tasks, or 10 RPM syncs, or R RPM repository syncs. Um, all of them are on demand. Um, they're all like small, small medium-sized repos. Um, you can see there's two two tasks running, which matches the number of online workers and nine in waiting. Um, and now I can see the number of completed tasks is going up, number of waiting tasks is going down, uh, and the number of remote artifacts is going up.
right? And after after it finishes syncing the ten repositories, um, it's going to go back and resync two of them um, in immediate mode. And so then we'll start seeing the on disk uh, going up. I should say the disk space saved. Um, this this is actually broken. Um, it, it it won't go down when the on disk um, goes up. It's it's only measuring like the size of the remote artifacts, which I guess don't get deleted. Um, so this is broken, but you get the idea. I'm guessing it also doesn't account for deduplication. Yeah, um, and that's another thing that we could you could potentially measure is, um, you know, measuring uh, how how much space is saved by having you know artifacts shared between multiple content artifacts, like multiple content. Daniel, while we're watching this run, about how long did it take you to build the support for the what the stats we're seeing here into our code base? Can you give us a ballpark? I so I'd say uh, ignoring like the time spent just trying to um, you know think of ideas, uh, maybe like and, and like debugging stuff I was doing wrong, um, maybe like an hour. Yep. Um, okay. Now I've I've done it in a very uh, hacky. I would not want to push this into production. Um, I've not I, I've I've not done it in a great way, but um, it was it was really easy to prototype with. I would say. Yeah, I would still try to share it even as is. One of the challenges is that people make things, and then. And people are like, oh, can you share this? And then they're like, yeah, I will. But first, let me. And then it never happens. Uh, I would say just unless there's a password in it, yeah. like an important password, like just send it out there. Yeah. Um, I'll, I can demo. OK, so first, uh, does anyone have questions? We can get to that first. I have loads. Sure. Um, well. Not not so much loads. First of all, I'm I'm exceptionally interested in this. Uh, we it's one area where I feel particularly uncomfortable is not having visibility of what's going on in the pulp world um, in production. You said that you wouldn't recommend using this. Is that from the perspective of the metrics gathering and production, or the GUI, the Grafana? I I would say I wouldn't recommend using this as is as I've currently implemented it. Um, so uh, we we could we could get this into a place we could probably get this into a place where um, we absolutely could enable this um, in production. I, I, I'm just saying for the purpose of this demo, this is a very this is a very demo y demo. Um, it's it's not. Uh, I I suppose I'm yeah. I'm more concerned. It on the pulp side, so ignoring everything to do with the GUI uh, and the representation. On the pulp side, are there are there risks to leveraging this in production? So generating those metrics and having them polled. Um, so that's a good question. So um, at least with these particular metrics. Um, we're hitting the database a lot, and the refresh rate is currently set to five seconds. I probably wouldn't want to have it refreshing that much in production, doing the calculations it's doing here. Um, so I, I hate to labor a point. Um, that refresh rate is the refresh rate of the Grafana dashboard that would be hitting, say, the Prometheus DB and doing those calculations. Let's say, for argument's sake, I really don't care about Grafana and Prometheus performance. Has it got any risks to the pulp database and performance? I'm guessing that's just down to how often you're scraping. 
Yeah, yeah. So what I'm saying is, so when when um, when Prometheus does the scraping, um, it's hitting it's hitting an endpoint on pulp, and it is running requests against the pulp database from inside pulp, and so any load. Um, any load generated by that is it's necessarily load on the pulp database. Okay. Um, so it's. Um, I think so this I'm, one's going to get at this. It's the same. Okay. Um, so I I don't know if this is the right time to talk about all of the different type of metrics that I think would be exceptionally interesting to have. Um, things like the longest running tasks, sync jobs that are running for a very long time. That sort of stuff, because I've gone back and I've seen uh, sync jobs that have been running for two or three days. It's ob there's obviously something there that's broken, um, and it would be really useful to have those metrics pulled out that we could then monitor and alert on through Prometheus um, and Grafana. Yeah, absolutely. I can definitely see that use case. Um, I just want to point out uh, a few quick things. So it's easy because because Grafana is pull based, or sorry, because Prometheus is pull based, and Grafana like configures Prometheus, I guess. Um, you you can dynamically configure the pull rate. So I can set it to update every minute, and now it'll only be doing those queries every minute, and that's like two clicks. So that's that's an easy thing to configure, um, or or thirty minutes, or you know, back to yeah. five seconds, ten seconds, or you can like specify your own, or every day, every two hours. Um, that, that that's not my understanding of how that refresh works, but I've never used it explicitly with Prometheus. I thought that was more how how often it goes to the Prometheus database to look for new information as opposed to controlling how often Prometheus goes out to the end clients to get the new data. So if you've got 10, but I think that's beside the point of this demonstration. Okay. So I'll let other people talk. You, you might be right on that. I, I'm i not 100% confident in my answer there. I certainly wouldn't want to be in a situation where a Grafana dashboard, someone could click on a five-second refresh rate and hit 10,000 servers at five seconds a pop for every check that's on that. that exactly. I, yeah. That would be bad. All right. Um, other questions? I guess I'll go. I threw my hand up there. Um, the the load that this puts on an instance, on a pulp instance, depends depends on how you've configured Prometheus to do the pull. So if we were to put all the the endpoint work in of things that could be collected, and you just never turn Prometheus on at all, there's no load on pulp. They're there but they don't impose any load simply by existing, which to yes. me is a, is, a, is a big benefit um, because that lets the, the installation admin decide how much load they're willing to put on pulp in order to get these results. And then I think the way this works, Douglas, if I recall correctly, is that the Prometheus configuration includes how often, here are all the endpoints I want you to query, how often are, are you going to query them? And I, it's usually like on a minute-ish basis is what you know I've seen, but that's completely up to the installation admin to to set that up. Um, and then, so Prometheus is is going to be out there putting the load that it's going to be putting on it because it's querying the endpoints once a minute or once every five minutes. And then, as you point out, Grafana's load is completely separate. You know, you could set the the refresh rate on this set of screens to whatever you want, and it'll put a load on the Prometheus server, which may not be, in fact, in in a production instance, isn't running on any piece of hardware that's running your actual services. It's off on the side, you know, given its own its own um, corral. Um, Grafana's putting a load on Prometheus. 
but ramping this up doesn't hammer your your production services into the ground that's under the control of how often does prometheus talk to them and what's the load that prometheus is putting on it um exactly and we have a certain amount of experience with this there there are other uh projects at red hat that use this this setup um and i just want to separate out that making the prometheus endpoints available doesn't say well now you have to use grafana because the Prometheus endpoints are just out there collecting the data that are out there. And if you're a production install that uses something other than Grafana to visualize data, you can take advantage of this. Um, having, having written some Grafana um, uh, screens to talk to Prometheus, the, the biggest danger to developers is once you start getting graphs to show up, you start it's you get lost in the wow this is really cool what else can i do and you can spend literally an infinite amount of time doing nothing but playing with this ui because it's cool so we'd have to put like timers on ourselves to not do that um but i'd really love to see just a standard this is a standard thing and and investigate the daniel you talked about the node the node access and the the postgres mm -hmm. access especially because those are really useful for for looking at what's going on um on on an instance having those available to our upstream users is really useful and then i'm also thinking about not just the red hat products but the rest of you that have products having this data gathering available i think could be really valuable in terms of how of being able to 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 figure out that you've got a problem before you start having users reporting that they're getting 500 errors or 503s. Yeah. Right, this is this is really cool. And I would I will second Brian's as well, Daniel. I would just, whatever you have for the endpoints, just push them somewhere in a branch and just say, this is what I did. And yes, they're ugly and they're they're the, the demoiest of demos, um, but just giving people an idea for, for what the code looks like is hugely valuable. This is great. Yeah. It comes up. So I do have some more content. I just wanted to stop here to ask some questions like before I move on. Um, Brian, Brian, have... Brian's got a question. Yeah, Brian, you've got your hand up. Um, yeah, I mean, just just a couple of quick comments. Uh, this is excellent. Um, uh, when I, I used to do a lot of work with um, folks at SAS, the statistical company, and one of the things that I've heard a lot from them was um, because they make a lot of dashboards with a lot of statistics and all those that their product set is really built on that. So they try to think about their products as I understand it as decision support systems and not and less about like um, statistics and charts and graphs. And um, and so they they try to think about what do users want in terms of supporting their decisions. And this goes back to what Doug, uh, Douglas was saying, like. I want to find problems. How do I find problems? Well, I need metrics that support my ability to find problems and things like that. So just a way of thinking about like, well, what, are, what would someone want to put in here? That's how I approach the problem. Um, also, um, this guy I used to work with Greg Konisberg was telling me that there are two kinds of metrics. There's vanity metrics <laughs> that you want because they're fun. And then there are metrics that uh, help affect your bottom line and help you execute on your stuff better. And it's good to have a little bit of both. Um, and also, I wanted to point out that um, InfluxDB is another alternative to things like Prometheus, which um, is nice because since it really specializes in time series data, it can provide summaries, kind of like what round robin database tooling does, like our RD tool, um, which is nice because it can summarize old, old data um, so that you can look at it on long time scales, but keeps the recent data in a very detailed way so that you can zoom in on it in a very clean way. And it provides really great statistical re-representations as you look at data from different time scales, um, which can be really, really nice. And I think maybe Prometheus does similar things, but um, but that's that that's a good thing to look at uh, as well. Those are just some comments, and this is a great. A great demo. Yeah. Oh yeah, and some user was interested in Prometheus, so we added it to a, the one line to our setup.py. So you can use Prometheus today without changing any code. You end up configuring Prometheus as a package in the installed apps, which should enable it. Um, I believe that's all that's required, and then um, you can install the package 
uh, as well. Yeah. Okay, so, so I'm going to try and um, move through uh, the rest of what I had, and then we can do more questions at the end. Um, so uh, the first thing I just want to point out, um, you can see, you know, the completed task has gone back to zero because it's only the last five minutes. Um, and you can actually change this. It's quite easy. I um, think it should be, well, I'll try and do that. Um, but I want to show how easy it is to change the data representation. Um, so uh, you can see currently uh, it's a stat data representation, but with like two clicks, you know, I can change it to a pie chart or time series and now you can see like the graphs. Um, or, you know, bar gauge, um, there's different ways you can, like, display that. Anyway, um, I also wanted to show, uh, how easy it is to add a new, um, statistic at a, statistic at a new, you know, panel. Um, so when you add a new, um, panel, the first thing you see is um, this. So you have to select your data source. Um, I want to select Prometheus. So, and then you have a metrics browser, so you can uh, scroll through um, some of the available ones. Um, the one I found interesting is uh, Django HTTP request latency, including middleware seconds bucket, or actually no, by, by view bucket. Um, this is not a particularly useful representation. Um, usually when something has a bucket in the name, you want to use a histogram. So let's select histogram, if I can scroll, here we go, histogram. And this is quite interesting. Um, so basically, you can see here, it has the latency histogram per endpoint. Um, so this is a lot, of, a lot of text, but it's easy to reformat the legend to show only the view name. Um, if it is going to update. Oh, yeah, there it goes. Um, so, yeah, so you can see, uh, for one thing, that the metrics endpoint doesn't seem to be, seem to be performing all that well. Um, so that's, that's one thing I point out. But another thing is, you know, the tasks detail endpoint seems to not be doing all that well. Um, and I, when I was testing this last night, um, it was the only one that showed up uh, over here. So it was, it was actually in the like 300 to 400 milliseconds per um, per request time frame. So like with without really all that much experimentation, like maybe five minutes worth, it's it's really easy to get you know kind of actionable information from this. Um, yeah, so then you can like, you know, move this around. And yeah. Um, so I've, and just to show off like what the metrics endpoint looks like. So this is, this is what the metrics look like. Um, it's just, uh, you know, like I mentioned earlier in the talk, it's a, there's a standardized format uh, that all of this is presented in. And, you know, any, any application can, can write out, 
you know, metadata in this format. And there's client libraries for like pretty much every lang programming language um, to like make this easier um, so that you don't have to manually, uh, uh, you know, do all this formatting yourself. There's nice abstractions for it. Um, and I also wanted to show, uh, so the node exporter data. Um, so this is, um, this is data about like CPU memory and all that stuff. Um, so you can see currently it's set to last 24 hours. I think I'll set it to the last one hour. Um, and uh, you can also see, you know, you can you can change the absolute time range, um, and you can browse, you know, back and forth in the history. Um, but here's the last hour of uh, history. Um, you can tell back when we did our syncs, there's a a huge spike in the CPU usage and and the a brief sync of the the memory usage. Um, and network traffic, especially, you can see that as well. Um, it was briefly using 200 megabits per second. Uh, you can see the disk disk space usage increased. Um, and of course, at the top here, you have gauges, um, number of CPU usages, you know, uptime, total amount of RAM, 10 gigabytes, root FS, 39 gigabytes. You know, twenty percent or twenty percent of that is used. Eighteen percent of RAM is used. Fifteen minute, fifteen minute average average of the system load time, or in five minute average, and the current CPU. Um, and there is uh, far more different, more detailed graphs here than I even have time or the ability to explain. Um, but it, it goes into much greater detail. Um, so you can see, you know, disk IOPS, uh, IO read write, um, I use utilization. Um, uh, it'll even it even shows, you know, context switches and interrupts, you know, system load counter, uh, CPU time spent in user mode and kernel mode, um, number of open file descriptors, um, you know, number of, oops, number of processes, number of forks, uh, disk Q size, average Q size, disk wait time, um, IOPS completed, that might be the same as I mentioned earlier, network traffic, network queue length, uh, lots of things I don't understand. Yeah, errors. In in the metrics that you grab, that you gather and um, send back, so to my point, uh, if you don't mind me asking. Um, sure. Uh, if we take as an example the a task that is the longest running task or the five longest running tasks, does it send back the task info? How, how easy would it be to tie that back to either via the GUI or via a separate um, utility to read the task explicitly? Does it send back that information? I'm pretty sure it would be possible. I'm not sure how easy it is, but I'm like, I'm like ninety percent sure it would be possible um, to, to break it break it down even on like a per, per process 
I know you can break it down on a per process basis. Um, I'm not sure if you can do it with node exporter. I know that you can do it with um, collect D and influx DB. Um, I know that because uh, the satellite team does some of that in their performance reporting when they you know tell us how how satellite is performing yep. um, when they test new releases um, some of those graphs are broken down on a per process basis um, and you can you can aggregate um, aggregate among various components like HTPD um, and uh, you know Python, and you could, you could aggregate it further into, you know, workers versus content apps. Um, suppose, if you're right, sorry. I suppose uh, that maybe the, the root of my question is what information is the um, the pulp node exporter? Um, how much information is it exporting and making available to? Um, whatever happens to scrape it, is there? What's the best way of seeing all of that information? And I suppose if there isn't some, if something's not there, it's either a pull request or raising a ticket um, to to get additional information added to the to the exporter. Yeah, so node exporter is separate from um, pulp. It's separate from the pulp statistics I was mentioning earlier. So. Um, this is not exposed through the pulp endpoint. This is exposed through a separate agent that's running on the box that's providing its own endpoint for all of these like statistics. Completion of terms. Um, I, I did mean explicitly the, the, the pulp one. So Douglas, correct me if I'm wrong, what you're looking for as an example isn't um, like the top five worst tasks are performing this badly it's this task is the this specific task doing this specific job performs yeah. really badly it, it, i mean it it, it uh that yeah. talks kind of brian to your comment about vanity versus um what was the other word that that uh, decision GPU support used? decision support i don't want to you know i just don't want to see a, a bar showing a bunch of tasks what i want to know is that particular task is bad i need to do something about it um, and I'm yeah. that really comes down to it, it's what data should the the um, the Prometheus probes, if you will, be gathering, and that is going to be it's it's exactly going to be a you know maybe we make a stab at this and we we it, we give some support in on a in a pulp exporter, and then all y'all that are using this in production look at that and go okay yeah but I'd like. I would like this to be able to make these kinds of decisions, and that's going to be iterative. We're, we're, you know, this is the kind of thing that that is going to iterate a ton. Which I find it really interesting, Brian, how this ties into the talk that Carl gave about both iterating and about making decisions based on gathering data, because this will give us an opportunity to gather data that we haven't had before. I, sorry, fine. Um, no, I was, I was just going to say, um, I uh, agree definitely, like this is would be very useful as we talk about um, expected performance for a particular workload and how large your system needs to be. Like right now, our recommendations for system sizing is, I mean, I, I don't have enough hands to wave. Um, and so this would like really help with that. We could run a workload, look at its um, usage and also I think it can help um, provide decision support around, especially those node and system metrics around right size in your box in terms of identifying the rate limiting component. Um, and you know maybe you don't need as much RAM on your AWS instance, or maybe you need more, whatever. Um, the other thing I was going to say was uh, to your question, Douglas. Maybe um, I'm not very familiar with PromQL or. Um, Prometheus, but when I was doing work with InfluxDB, for example, one of the, and I think this is what PromQL is going to do as well, um, you would use the expression language for like InfluxDB or I guess PromQL to create views into the data that would join reporting from individual components. And so 
if we had a pulp component reporting information that also reported its times and like start and end time for that offending task and its process ID, for example, just as its metrics, then you could take the node data and you could create a view that would issue the join there. And that's a very powerful model because um, those components like the pulp metrics don't have to be built to support a particular use case. They just have to be built to be joinable against other data. And that view would let you look at, okay, so what's happening like CPU wise on that specific task? I, I can possibly give a, a corollary with our configuration management. So we're, we're actively um, rolling out Prometheus and doing the work to, to be able to monitor our estate. And one of the big things was around our configuration management utility. Um, and with that, you're able to, they have formulas which will manage a particular set of things. And we're able to break down uh, which formula takes the longest to run, um, which formula in which location takes the longest to run, um, which salt masters or the salt ones take the longest overall. Um, and from there, we're able to, to focus our attention on the worst behaving formulas, possibly the worst written, or maybe it's it, yeah just the least efficient um, on the surface. And it would be really useful to have a, a similar visibility into here, but the crux of it is whether the data is there to munge together to get that visibility. Um, yeah, so to that question, I'm, I'm not sure how to do it, but I'm like 90% sure that it's possible somehow. I suppose the big thing there is me getting uh, time for my uh, boss to be able to do a proof of concept to this internally um, and start working out which bits don't work the way we would like them to work and just go from there. OK. Um, so one last thing I, I was going to show off real quick. So there's also like a PostgreSQL dashboard. Um, that has a bunch of those statistics. It's cool. It's potentially useful. You can see, you know, longest transaction took a second. You know, maybe that's you know useful information. Um, there's, a, you know, there's a good. There's a lot of good things we could do with this sort of information. Um, and so, uh, any other questions? Okay. Hey, Robin, can we get budget to hire somebody to do nothing but statistics gathering and analysis of pulp and just have that be a full time position? <laughs> um, I have not thought about that before. <laughs> so if you open that position, can I apply for it? 